Hi, I'm JP and you're watching Liberty On Demand. We hope you are having a fantastic week. Now let's watch last Sunday's message. That would only happen to me. I get to take my mask off. That's the only reason I said yes, I'll speak. All right, so how's everybody doing? Uh, I, I just want to say thank you to the worship team and, and the setup crew. Uh, you guys do an amazing job every single week. Um, I really appreciate that song. Yeah, give them a hand. Give them a hand. So uh, most of you guys know me. Some of you maybe you don't. Uh, some of you at home. Uh, my name is Joe. Um, we've been uh, coming to Liberty for about two and a half years now. And uh, my better half, her name is Chelsea. Everybody give her a round of applause, please. I would not be, I would not be where I'm at without her for sure. Um, so, uh, believe it or not, um, she's older than me. Hi. So, I mean, not just, not just mentally, that, that's a given. Um, <laughs> that's a given. That's pretty much everybody in the room, to include the little ones. Um, but uh, by almost two full months. So, she's basically robbing the cradle with me. <laughs> I'm a baby. But uh, we have three beautiful daughters. Uh, if you feel inclined to pray for me, I do live in an estrogen ocean. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I got Emery, my, my oldest, she's seven. Uh, Vea, who's four, and Olivia will be one here in just a couple of weeks. So um, 17 more years? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> just kidding. I love my girls. Um, so we came from, uh, we come from the great state of Idaho. If you, I don't know if you can see it. There we go. So the, the one in the middle there, Chelsea wanted me to put a, a geographic picture so everybody knows where Idaho is because people are like, oh, it's Iowa. No, 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 Idaho. So it's the little red L looking shape there. And then the picture on the left, that's actually uh, a backpacking trip that I went on with Chelsea's brother Clark and my friend Roger. Uh, we spent a couple days backpacking and that's uh, caught a bunch of fli- uh, fish, did fly fishing. And the one on the right, that's Idaho in the uh, wintertime. I did not take that picture, but it is a beautiful state. Uh, that's where we're from, so... Uh, we came from a church called Celebration Life, or Celebrate Life, and now it's called Celebration Church. Um, we mostly did youth ministry there for about four, four and a half years, and then we kind of transitioned into a purpose-driven ministry, trying to get people introduced to ministry in a certain kind of way to where they would step into a ministry that's more purposed for them and their calling versus just um, volunteering in, in, a, in a position that is open or available or a need. Not that that's wrong because there's a time for everything, right? Sometimes you got to feel a need that, that is there, um, but maybe not long term. Uh, we did that uh, for a couple, uh, I think about a year and a half, we did that, that ministry uh, toward the end before we got uh, stationed here. But uh, that, that was the purpose of my ministry, and that's where I really found my calling. My calling is to get people from where they are to where God wants them to be, to get people from where they are to where they should be, Right? Uh, sometimes we don't like to hear that, but uh, that's really my purpose. So I'm really hoping that today um, I can help everybody get one maybe baby step closer to their purpose. So uh, let's pray and then we'll get into the message. Hey, Father, Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for this church and I thank you for this family that you've given us over here in the UK. Lord, I just ask that you use me as your voice. Lord, uh, speak through me, help me to speak clearly. And Lord, let, uh, let our hearts be changed and let us leave here differently than we came today. Say it in your name. Amen. All right, so how many of you are really, really bad with directions? So Lacey, Kaylee, somebody raising their spouse's hands, I love it, all right. So I, I always thought that I was really good with directions, like I, I'm good, I got this, I have this amazing sense of direction. And then I got stationed in the UK and I realized that I just knew my surroundings really well in Idaho. Um, here it's always overcast, so I'm like north, and they're like, no, that's west. I'm like, how do you know that? So uh, it turns out I'm, I'm uh, forever stuck with GPS, especially in the UK. So, <clears throat> so there, there, there's three basic things that we know about uh, directions, right? The first is we don't try to get lost. We're not ever going to get out there and try to get lost. That's not the intention, right? Maybe somebody wants to get, maybe they do want to get lost on the way to work. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. The second thing, the second truth about getting lost is we don't know when we're getting lost we just know when we are lost, right? We're just, we're driving along. We're just like, see a sign. You're like, oops, right? Or it's like, you're the direction somebody writes out for you. They're like, if you hit the train tracks, you've gone too far. <sighs> too far. You know you're lost. The third thing that we know about directions 
is that whatever road you're on ultimately determines your destination. It determines where you end up. I call it the path principle. The path, the path principle says that your direction determines your destination. And we need to think, we, we tend to think that we can get around this path principle at times, that our intentions matter maybe just a little bit more than our direction. But in reality, it's our direction, not your intention, that determines your destination. That's a tough one to swallow at times. <laughs> So I, I'm a mountain biker. Um, I'm not a particularly good mountain biker. Um, I can get down the mountain. Sometimes getting down the mountain means falling down the mountain. As, as a lot of people here know, I've, I've ruined bikes for Tony, I think, um, unfortunately. But uh, I get down the mountain, and for whatever reason, I get to the bottom of the mountain, and I'm like bruised and banged and beat up, and I'm like, yeah, let's, let's load up and do this again. And I, I go up there, and I, I go down, and I fall down the mountain some more. It's, it's a great time. I have a great relationship with my mountain bikes. But, uh, excuse me. So there's, uh, when I first got here, I was like, all right, where's all the mountain bike parks? That's what I want to do. I want to go mountain biking. So I find this place in Wales called Bike Park Wales. Some incredibly good marketing. Like, you, like you can't get, like, oh, what's Bike Park Wales? You know what Bike Park Wales is. They did a good job with the name. But uh, w- this bike park uh, is straight west of here. I don't know if this is west, but we're going to say that this is west for the sake of this, okay? So this is west. Stop it. Stop it, Phil. That's west. <laughs> See, I told you I'm horrible with it here. I, I, where's the North Star? <laughs> so there's this killer place in, uh, in Wales called Bike Park Wales. But if I were to load up, it's straight west of here. If, but if I were to load up all my gear, my bikes, and my helmets, and yes, helmets, because I tend to fall down and I need more than one most of the time. Um, if I load it all up and I go east, I'm never going to get to Bike Park Wells. It's just, it's just not going to happen. It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter if I intend on getting there. If I head east, I'm never going to get there. I'm going to hit the water and be like, where's the bike park? It doesn't matter what my intentions were when I got in. So the principle of the path applies to every single path that we've got, right? Whether it's your marriage, your dating life, your friends, your children, your goals, your dreams, your desires, whatever it is, the path principle applies. And that is that it is always your direction, not your intentions, not your hopes, not your dreams. It is your direction that ultimately determines your destination. So God, God put this message on my heart a few years ago. And I think it's because I had all these great intentions. And uh, I, I'm going to be real with you guys. I had, you know, when Chelsea and I were dating, I had all these really great intentions. I'm going to be this amazing husband, right? And then we got married a few years down the road. We were, Chelsea was pregnant. All right, I'm going to be this great father. I'm going to do all these great things, right? When I, was a young, uh, when I was a young airman in the Air Force, I was like, all right, well, when I become the boss, I'm going to be this, I'm not going to be like all these other guys. I'm going to be this perfect boss. I'm going to be great. Everybody's going to love me. But no matter what, for a time, it just seemed like every time I was just falling short, falling short, falling short. No matter what my intentions were, I was falling short. But the reality of it was that I had good intentions, but I wasn't being intentional with my actions to get there. And that led me to failure time and time and time again. It was beating me up. I think we can probably all relate to that, at least in a way. So that was a, sorry, I missed the slide. Having good intentions without being intentional about your actions will lead to failure. Maybe you've seen this. Maybe you've seen it in your own life. Maybe somebody else has pointed it out to you in your, for, in your life and you didn't like it too much. Someone tells you the story of their life, right? And they, they're just, they're down on themselves. They're brokenhearted. They don't understand what's going on. And they say, I don't understand how I got here. And you're just, you're, you're the person on the outside looking in and you're just thinking, well, what did you expect? Right, you have a different perspective than they do, and they don't understand. It's because they've been walking around like this, just taking steps blindly, not being intentional about anything. And you're just sitting there, sitting back, going, thinking to yourself, "I, I could have told you that. What were you expecting was going to happen? Your intentions never led to any action. You didn't end up where you wanted to be because of it." 
It's because I think that we, we think. We think that our intentions, our hopes, and dreams are somehow going to trump our decisions that we make. We think that. I think naturally we think that. But the truth is that the path principle trumps our hopes and dreams and intentions every single time without fail. So Acts, it, Acts is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And in this book, in chapter 9, we read about how Saul persecuted the church and was basically laying waste to Christians, right? So in, in, the, in the Bible, it says the word zealously. He was, he was persecuting and killing Christians with zeal. And I don't think that's as, uh, it, reading it, I think a lot of times we don't take that as seriously as we should. He was killing people because he believed they were wrong. So Saul was a man that every follower of Christ knew about and every follower of Christ was terrified of because they thought that he was gonna come for him, them next. But after Saul saw the truth about Jesus, he became Paul, right? And there's a whole conversion story there that I encourage you to read, but the direction of his life changed forever when he encountered Jesus. So in Acts 9, Saul was on this extremely specific path, and it, it lays it out very, very well for us, and we'll read it here in a minute. But he was headed to Damascus, so that's the setup for it. So let's read Acts chapter 9, 1 and 2. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested the letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their co cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So Saul had chosen this path, right? Based on what he thought were good intentions. Not only that, but the intentions that he had with it were legal. Right? They, they weren't just intentions, they were, le they were laws. It was legal for him to do this. So he thought this was the right thing to do. He thought that the teachings about Jesus being the Messiah and God resurrecting him from the dead was a false teaching that he wanted to correct by entirely eradicating his followers. He wanted them all gone. He wanted them all dead. See you later. That's what his goal was. Until one day, like I said, he was on the road to Damascus and he encounters Jesus. His intentions on the way there were to arrest and possibly murder Christians. Because I don't know about you, but if I hear that a guy's coming to kill me because I'm a Christian, I'm probably not just going to say, okay, you got me. No, you're probably going to resist, right? You're, you're not just going to stand there and take it. You're going to resist because you've experienced Jesus. You've experienced Christ. You know what the truth is. You're not going to put up with that. So basically, Jesus confronts Saul. He asks, I'm going to just kind of briefly explain it to you instead of reading the whole thing uh, for the sake of time. So he asks why he's persecuting. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus ends up blinding Saul and then tells him to go to Damascus and wait, and he'll tell you what to do. Which is strange, right? Because he listens. He, does, this, he listens to Jesus, the guy that he thinks is a false prophet, right? <laughs> but, I mean, think about it. You hear this audible voice. You're blinded. Okay, maybe I'm going to check this out. Maybe I'm going to check this out and see, what, see where, where, where this goes. So Saul was blind for three days when a guy named Ananias showed up and prayed for him. Now Ananias, God went to Ananias beforehand and said, Ananias, I need you to go and pray for Saul. And he goes, <clears throat> what? Saul, Saul, like Saul, Saul, that, that Saul. He's like, yep, I don't think you had your pills this morning, Jesus, because that sounds crazy. But Ananias listened to God anyway, right? He shows up, he prays for, for Saul, the scales fall off and he, his sight is restored. That I, I, when I look at that scripture, I think, why, did Jesus really need to send Ananias to restore his, his sight? I, mean, I, I don't think so. So why did he do it? I just think this, this is a, a small nugget within the message. I, I find it strange that he sent Ananias to do this. I think it was both for Christians to realize that there was a change taking place, but it was also a tangible thing that Saul could see happen to convert him to Paul. So I think that's why he did it, because Jesus, Jesus doesn't need any of us to do anything for him. He doesn't. He chooses us to do it because it gives us all tangible things to see and relate to. 
So Ananias shows up, he prays for him, he, his sight is restored. Saul becomes Paul and he became the God's instrument to take the message of Christ to the Gentiles, being the non-Jewish people, to the kings and the people of Israel. Saul had an experience with God that shifted the direction of his life. He was on a path, and that encounter shifted the rest of his life. Think about it. He was going to arrest Christians. He was going to Damascus to arrest Christians, and in between where he was at and Damascus, he encounters Jesus, and then he gets to Damascus, waits for three days, and now he's preaching about Jesus in the synagogues. There's nobody else that can do that other than Jesus. There's nobody else that would do that if they could. This man was killing people. Human nature, for me, would take over and be like, no, I'm sorry. You're out of here. Put him in locks and chains or something. The only person that could do that was Jesus. So back to, to Bike Park Wells. If I was headed east to go to Bike Park Wells, right, because I use GPS everywhere I go because clearly I have no sense of direction here and I need GPS even to get home most time. Uh, if, I, if I head east, my GPS is going to be yelling at me, turn around. At the roundabout, take a U-turn. At the roundabout, take a U-turn. Like, I don't want to. God's doing the same thing, not, not, not necessarily audibly, right? He's, he's speaking to us, but through the word of God and through our closest friends and family members and people that we trust, our accountability partners, if you will. God's word is our GPS to the desired destination of our lives. I wanna say that again. The word of God, the Bible, scripture, is his GPS to the, his desired destination for our lives. It's probably not too hard for anybody to think of someone uh, in your life or maybe yourself who you've watched head in the wrong direction. I've had a lot of friends that I watched go down the wrong direction and uh, some of it turned out okay, some of it didn't turn out okay. But when I looked at them, I saw them making those decisions and I knew, I knew, even though I'd never been down that path, I knew where it was leading. We've all, had, we've all, got, all got people in our lives like that. We know exactly what's gonna happen. You know the outcome before it, it hits. You know where they're gonna end up if they don't make a shift. Have you ever talked to someone out about an event? You're like, oh, I went out and did this, and then this happened, and like midway through the story, they cut you off, and you say, oh, man, when, you, when that happened, I bet you felt such and such, right? Or, oh, man, I bet this happened then. And you're just like, yeah, how did you? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. That's exactly how I felt. How did you know that? And it's because it, it's not unique. This path principle applies through everything in our lives. We can see the outcome if we really look for it. And people on the outside looking in typically can see that for you. They know what the destination is going to be. Because your destination is always determined by your direction every single time. Our culture... Um, often hands us a disconnect, right? That says, as long as your intentions are good, it doesn't really matter what path you take, right? You're, you got good intentions. But there's a saying that we've probably all heard, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The path that you're on will trump those good intentions every time. According to the religious leaders of the time, Saul had all the right ideas. He did. Everything he was doing was perfectly legal, and not only that, but encouraged. It was encouraged. Here's the disconnect that it looks like in, in many of our lives. You know, maybe you're a new Christian, maybe you're, you've been doing this for a while, but you look at somebody, you're like, man. You see somebody on a podcast, you listen to, to Phil speak on a Sunday, you're like, I want, I want that in my life. I wanna be like, like this person. They're so close to God, their, their walk is on point, they're going in the direction they should be going in, and that's what I want for my life. So you're like, all right, I'm doing this, I'm all in, I'm doing it, I'm gonna set my alarm 30 minutes early, I'm gonna wake up early, I'm gonna spend some time with God before anything else happens in the day, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna read my Bible. So your alarm goes off in the morning, you wake up, you roll over, you grab your phone, and click on the Facebook, let's be real. Next thing you know, 30 minutes rolls by, you're like, oh, I gotta get ready for work, right? You had good intentions, but you had no actions. So 
Some of us are even picking paths and we have no clue where we're going. We have no clue the direction we're headed in. We're just blindly walking, hoping that we don't run into something or something doesn't kill us. But there's other people around us. If you're smart, you have people that are around you that are wiser than you are. They have a different perspective than you do. It's a good thing to have many advisors in your life, right? That's what the Bible teaches. I hope that you have somebody like that in your life that can say, I've seen your behavior, I've seen the choices you're making, and I'm here to tell you, because I'm your friend, that you're headed down the wrong path. You're going somewhere that is not gonna be good. The question is, is when we hear that voice calling out, will we listen? Will we know? Will we know the voice when it's calling out, right? Or will we think that somehow we're gonna break the principle of the path? Somehow we're gonna be that exception to the rule, right? It's not gonna happen. I'm here to tell you, it's not happening. We need to learn to look at the road signs that are all around us and listen because every path is a predetermined destination. What path are you on I want you all to ask yourselves this this week. What path are you on and where is it taking you? This week I challenge you, whether, you, whether you've been a Christian forever or a couple weeks or you're on the fence or you're like, I don't know about that, that God stuff, read, read Acts chapter nine. Read about Saul's conversion and ask God to show you where your direction is taking you. If it's not where you intended on going, that's Okay. That is 100% okay. You're gonna, you, this isn't like a one and done thing, right? You're gonna be doing this all your life if you're, if you're smart. God, is this, is this where I should be headed? Ask him to give you the courage then to do something about it if you're not on the right path. Let's pray. Hey, Father God, I just thank you for today. I thank you so much for this message, Lord. And I just ask you give us all the courage to be more intentional about the actions that we take, Lord, to put ourselves on the right path towards you. God, I thank you so much again for this church. And I pray that you bless it beyond measure. Say in your mighty and precious name, amen. Thank you for watching last Sunday's message. We hope you have a fantastic rest of your week and we will see you next Sunday.